My name is Timothy Atik. I am the student ministry pastor here at the Ridge, and I'm so glad that um, uh, those, those elves that you saw earlier, those were actually two adults from the student ministry, and I'm just glad that you kind of got a glimpse into some of the life-changing work that we're doing um, <laughs> here at the Ridge in the student ministry. But what I want to do this morning is I want to do one more thing that's just going to give you a little taste of what things are like in the student ministry. I want to play a game with you guys that we've actually played in the high school group. Um, it's called Two Lies and a Truth, okay? It, let me introduce these three guys to you right here. This guy right here, excuse me, is Andrew Deerhood. He is the middle school director here at the Ridge. <clears throat> Right next to him is Michael Summers. He's the creative program director here. And right next to him is the newest addition to the student ministry team. That's Mark Zeiler. He's the new high school director here at the Ridge. Here's how Two Lies and a Truth works. One of these men right over here has actually had a bad motorcycle accident at some point in his past. But all three of these guys right now are going to tell you the story about the time when they had a bad motorcycle crash. And you need to decide which one's telling the truth and which one's lying, whose testimony can truly be trusted. All right, so let's start with Andrew. Andrew, if you will tell us the story about the time when you had a bad motorcycle accident. Sure. Um, so I used to travel professionally wakeboarding. And then, um, so, so basically during the summer, we'd travel and be gone every weekend and we come home on a Monday and basically not want to wakeboard and just kind of relax. And relaxing for us meant we, we, we would just ride dirt bikes. So um, um, me and some friends were heading out for a weekend, uh, not a weekend, but on a Monday, heading out to a motocross um, racetrack. Started racing a little bit, and there's a jump called the tabletop, which is about a 60-foot gap that you've got to hit um, going pretty quick. And if you don't, you're going to case it. It's an awful wreck. It hurts really bad. And uh, sure enough, I didn't hit enough... Uh, I didn't hit the ramp with enough speed and then, um, just ended up just wrecking and uh, I, I, I got knocked out, broke my left wrist and broke my right leg. So Very nice. Pretty Thanks, awful. Andrew. Well done. <laughs> Michael. Yeah. Um, so in college, I was standing outside of a building on campus and I saw a big plume of smoke. So I hopped on my motorcycle and went to go check out and see what it was. So I cruise out to the highway, and uh, what happened is on 35, the highway kind of takes an incline and a decline, and so I went up the incline, came down on the other side of the, on the decline, and traffic has completely stopped because the giant plume of smoke is from a gas truck that had exploded. So traffic has completely stopped. I'm going to hit the guy in front of me because I'm going about 55 at this point, and I have about probably 100 feet to, uh, till I get to the car in front of me, and so I swerve off to the right. I hit some loose gravel, I lay my bike down, and uh, I was behind my bike at first, but by the time I stopped sliding, I was in front of my bike, so I had to have rolled at some point, and my glasses flew off, off-duty EMT comes and checks me out, I've got my whole back is road rash, and, um, and so I'm laying there, he says I don't need to get in the ambulance, and so I, my roommate comes and picks me up, taking me to go get new glasses, because my glasses flew off, the radio's on, I hear... There's been a wreck at so-and-so exit involving a motorcycle, and the motorcyclist is reported to have died. So I heard myself <laughs> reported dead on the radio. <laughs> Glad well that done. Wasn't true. Mark? <laughs> My friend Mike Benedict's dad had a Ducati motorcycle, and so one afternoon we snuck it out of the garage and decided to hit it on I-10. So we took turns, and I'm flying down I-10, and I'm coming up to the Shepherd exit. And if you've been there before, all of a sudden, all the cars are like stopped. And there was an 18-wheeler right next to me. And so he slams on the brakes and is about to hit the car in front of him. So starts swerving into my lane. Well, I was going to swerve left, but there's a car next to me. So I reacted, freaked out, and ended up going towards the 18-wheeler. Fell over, slid underneath the 18-wheeler onto the shoulder of the highway, then slid into the grass about 20 feet. And I got up and was like, okay, I'm alive. And the motorcycle was all messed up. Mike's dad was not happy. Very nice. So let's uh, vote by round of applause. <laughs> Which one of these three men is telling the truth? Is it Andrew? Round of applause if you think it's Andrew. How about Michael? 
How about Mark? The honest truth is that Michael Summers in the middle is the man who uh, had a bad motorcycle accident. Thanks for y'all's help this morning, boys. Appreciate it. Here's why I wanted to play that game with you. As we jump back into 1 John this week, um, you need to know that the book of 1 John was written by the Apostle John in large part to help his audience distinguish between a testimony that is true and a testimony that is true. False. If you're new to Austin Ridge, let me just kind of catch you up. All fall, we have been walking verse by verse through the book of 1 John. A little background to the book is that the Apostle John is advanced in age. He's writing to a young group of Christians in a city called Ephesus, and he is encouraging them with the truth because there is different false teaching that is beginning to crop up and threaten the church. And in the same way that Mark and Andrew and Michael sat over here and each one claimed to be telling the truth about their motorcycle accident, there's different people in John's time that are claiming to be telling the truth about Jesus Christ. And what we're going to see today in 1 John chapter 5 is that John is basically going to summon three witnesses. He's going to kind of move his audience into a courtroom. And he's going to summon three witnesses who are each going to testify to the testimony that God has given about Jesus. And the hope is that truth would prevail. And the truth is this, that Jesus Christ is in fact the Son of God. If you remember last week, we talked about this idea of Jesus as the Son of God. That phrase, Son of, in, in um, Hebrew tradition to say that someone is the son of something, it doesn't necessarily have to imply subordination. There's times where it can imply equality to, or it can imply the identity of nature. So when you refer to Jesus as the son of God, uh, it can mean that Jesus is actually equal to God, but not only that, it is identifying that Jesus actually has a divine nature. And even beyond that, Jesus is in fact God manifested in human form. Jesus Christ is fully God, fully man, the God-man as the Son of God. That's why when Jesus was on trial and he stood before Pontius Pilate, uh, the Jews cried out to Pilate, and here's what they said in John 19, verse 7. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Why are they accusing him? Of, they, they are accusing him of blasphemy. Why? Because by making himself out to be the son of God, he is actually making himself out to be God in the flesh. And so what John is going to do today is he's going to summon three witnesses, and each of these witnesses is going to testify to the truth that Jesus is, in fact, the son of God. If you have your Bibles open up to 1 John chapter 5, we're going to um, look at verses 6 through 12 today. Let me read you verses 6 through 8. John's going to introduce the witnesses. Here's what he says. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It's the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. He starts out kind of weird. He says that Jesus Christ came with water and blood. Let me just kind of give you a little more background of what's going on. We talked about this a few weeks ago, but there's a false teacher in John's time named Serinthus. And what Serinthus is advocating is that um, Jesus and the Christ are actually two separate beings. And what Serenthus would say is that the Christ, the divine Christ, actually descended upon the human Jesus at his baptism, but then left him right before his crucifixion. So John summons two witnesses to kind of refute this, and the two witnesses that he summons are the water and the blood. And that's weird terminology, but John is basically referring to, when he refers to the water, he's simply referring to the baptism of Jesus Christ. And when he refers to the blood, he's referring to the crucifixion 
of Jesus Christ. So his first witness is the water, the baptism of Jesus Christ. Let me just remind some of you and share with you for the first time what actually happened at the baptism of Jesus. Here's what it says in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It says this, After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So at his baptism, Jesus comes to John the Baptist, and he says, John the Baptist, I need you to baptize me. And John the Baptist is like, dude, you got to be crazy. If anyone's going to be baptizing anyone here, I need you to baptize me. And Jesus says, no, you're baptizing me. And John baptizes Jesus, and as he comes out of the water, the heavens part open, and the Spirit of God descends upon Jesus like a dove. And then the Father booms from heaven. He says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. So at the baptism of Jesus Christ, Jesus is declared by the Father in heaven to be the Son of God. But I don't know that Serenthus would debate this because as we just talked about, Serenthus, even he believed that something divine was happening at the baptism of Jesus. And so John calls his second witness, and his second witness is the blood, the crucifixion of Christ. So John is basically saying, okay, well, Serenthus, Jesus didn't just come with water, he came with blood also. So at the crucifixion of Jesus, Jesus is hung up on a cross. There's a criminal on either side of him, and then there's all these different people around. There's chief priests, um, there's scribes, there's soldiers, there's common people, and everyone's standing around looking at Jesus. There's people hurling insults at him. There's people mocking him and laughing at him. There's people crying out to him saying, hey, if you truly are the Messiah, then come off the cross and save yourself. And at a certain point, the entire sky went black for three hours. And after that time, Jesus looked up into, a, into the heavens and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And right after that, here's what the Bible says happens. Mark chapter 15, verses 37 through 39. Listen to this. And Jesus uttered a loud cry, and he breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. You hear it? So at his baptism, Jesus is declared the Son of God by his Father in heaven. At his crucifixion, Jesus is declared the Son of God by the centurion who is is standing and watching. And so this stands in direct opposition to the false teaching that's out there because John basically pulls out the bookends of Jesus' ministry. He says, hey, you know what? From the beginning to the end, Jesus was declared the Son of God. He is, in fact, the Son of God. This is a huge truth that we must understand. Because let me ask you this, what if Serenthus had been right? Let me ask you, listen to this. Would you be able to give an account or an answer if someone was to come to you and say, Jesus was only human at his crucifixion? Or they ask it a different way, why is it so important to you that Jesus was the Son of God at his crucifixion. Why is it so important? Does that affect our faith? If Jesus was actually only human at his crucifixion, it absolutely does. Let me illustrate it like this. Say you have a brain tumor and you are scheduled to have surgery to have your brain tumor removed tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. So you go home, you don't sleep well tonight, you get up in the morning, you make your way to the hospital, you get there bright and early, they have you fill out a bunch of paperwork, and then they lay you on a bed, and some nurses start prepping you for surgery, and this guy walks in the room, and he says, hi, I'm Fred, I'll be doing your surgery today, and you say, hi, Dr. Fred, nice to meet you, he says, not, no, 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 not Dr. Fred, just Fred, and you say, with a little bit of concern, well, you're a neurosurgeon, right, he's like, yeah, right, I would have never made it through all those years of medical school. No. Hey, my hobby on Mondays is I I come up to the hospital, I walk down the hall, I read people's charts, and you know what? I read yours. Yours sounded interesting with this brain tumor thingy. I found some some scrubs. I just figured I'd come come in here and try and try and help you out. 
It causes you a little concern, number one, because he referred to your brain tumor as a brain tumor thingy, and you start questioning, is this the guy who can really help me? Now, let's be honest. Can we all agree that there is absolutely nothing that Fred can do to successfully, keyword, successfully remove that brain tumor from you? Why? Because he's not qualified. He's not a doctor who has been qualified to open up people's heads and take tumors out of them. So let me ask you this. If Jesus was only human at his crucifixion, give me one reason why he would be qualified to open up our lives and to remove sin from it. The honest truth is that if Jesus was only a human at his crucifixion, then he's in the same circumstances that you and I are. If he's just a human, then he has his own sin issues for which he himself needs a savior. Because the honest truth is that God and God alone is perfect. And how can the wrath of a perfect God be satisfied? The only way for the wrath of a perfect God to be satisfied is if God satisfies his wrath himself. And that's why Jesus is called the Son of God. And that's why John refers to Jesus in the book of 1 John as the propitiation for our sins. What does propitiation mean? It means satisfaction. Jesus is the satisfaction for the wrath of God on our behalf. Does that make sense? John calls his first two witnesses the water and the blood. Then he calls his third witness. His third witness is the Holy Spirit. He calls the Holy Spirit. Look at how he ends verse 6. At the end of verse 6, he says, It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. Let me read for you the opening introduction to the book of Romans. Listen to what Paul says in relationship to Jesus being the Son of God and the Holy Spirit. Listen to what he says. Romans chapter 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to who? According to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. So at his baptism, Jesus was declared the Son of God by his Father in heaven. At his crucifixion, Jesus was declared the Son of God by the centurion who was standing by. Then at his resurrection from the dead, Jesus was declared the Son of God by the Holy Spirit. But not only that, let me share with you John chapter 15, verse 26, which tells us what the Holy Spirit's job is every single day. If you want to know what the role of the Holy Spirit is, if that's kind of mystical to you, here is the role of the Holy Spirit. John 15, verse 26. When the Helper, that's the Holy Spirit, comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. So not only did the Holy Spirit testify that Jesus is the Son of God at his resurrection, but the Spirit continues to testify every single day and will forevermore testify and declare that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the Son of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who testifies, convicts, and declares to the hearts of all of humanity who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. And if you're sitting in here today and part of you is beginning to understand for the first time who Jesus truly is as the Son of God, that is the Holy Spirit beginning to work in your heart, illuminating your heart to what is true. Does that make sense? John finishes verse 8. Look at what he says. He says that the blood and the water, the Spirit, all three are in agreement. What John is doing is he is appealing to Old Testament law. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, at the end of the verse, um, the law says this, on the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. So what John is saying is, this is what people accept as true. If there is a matter that is confirmed by two or three witnesses, then people trust it as true. 
the blood, the water, the spirit, all three are in agreement. Therefore, it is true that Jesus Christ actually is the Son of God, the God-man, fully God, fully man, at the exact same time. John goes on, look at what he says in verse 9. Verses verses 9 and 10 say this, If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. John brings up a great point. Here's his point. You know what? If you can accept something as true from another human being because there's two or three people that support that, then surely you can trust God who has given testimony of his son and he's given us three witnesses who testify that Jesus is in fact the son of God. I was thinking about it this week, but even, even us today, we don't, we don't look for two or three witnesses to confirm if what someone tells us is true, right? Like if I were to go out into the foyer after this and you were to come up and introduce yourself and say, hey, uh, Timothy, I'm, I'm Mark, and I'd be like, yeah, we'll see about that. Excuse me, um, is his name Mark? Oh, it is. Excuse me, uh, is his name Mark? Uh, oh, it is. Hey, Mark, I'm Timothy. Hey, nice to meet you. I, I just need to... Just check up on things. You, you understand, right? We don't do that. I was thinking about when we, when we were growing up, how many of us looked to our mom and dad for expert medical advice? You know what I'm talking about? Whatever our mom or dad said, we believed that it was true. This week I was listening to another pastor who was sharing some medical myths And I was like, these are really fascinating. And the honest truth is that many of us grew up believing myths that we heard from our parents. And some of us who are parents now are actually sharing those myths with our kids. Let me share with you a few medical myths. And you determine if you believed any of these or honestly if you still believe these to this day. Here's one. Don't go out in cold weather with wet hair because you will catch a cold. Heard that before? You catch a cold when you go from cold weather. You don't catch it from cold weather. The honest truth is that cold weather causes everyone to stay inside. So everyone is closer to each other. So when one person's sick, they're more likely to get other people sick. Here's the next one. Eating chocolate will cause you to break out with acne. I'm convinced that this originated from a mom who was sick of her teenage daughter eating chocolate. So she was like, that's fine. You can eat that chocolate. It'll give you a bunch of acne. In that moment, chocolate became like kryptonite to a teenage girl who thinks that chocolate will give her acne. What about this one? Don't swallow your gum because it takes seven years to pass through your system. <laughs> that is completely false. But do you remember being a kid and you accidentally swallow your gum? It's like, good luck in there, old friend. <laughs> you know? What about this? Don't crack or pop your knuckles because it will cause arthritis later in life. It will not cause arthritis. It might cause annoyance, but it will not cause arthritis. What about this one? Don't sit too close to the TV because it can hurt your eyesight permanently. I'm convinced that this was started by a dad who was just trying to watch college football on a Saturday, and his little kid ended up sitting too close to the TV and was blocking his view. So he's like, dude, that's going to kill your eyesight. Get out of the way. (laughs) Get out of the way. But did you grow up believing any of these myths? You you didn't call your doctor when you were five and be like, hey, doc, my parents just told me this. I'm just calling to confirm. No, you just trusted it. The funny thing is that God gives testimony to his son, and he declares Jesus is the son of God, and he even gives us proof, and then we get skeptical. People from other religions or people who are non-religious, they hear that Jesus is the Son of God. He's fully God, fully man, and they say, no way. There's no way that that's true. There's no way Jesus couldn't have been God. He is a good guy. You know what? 
I believe that he was a very virtuous man who we can learn things from. He was probably a prophet, but he wasn't God. And what John just said is if you deny that Jesus is the Son of God, you are calling God a liar. Why? There's a lot of people out today who will say, I have no problem with God. I just don't buy into all the Jesus stuff. Do you realize how contradictory that is? Because God actually declares that Jesus is the Son of God. So if you have a problem with Jesus, you have a problem with God. Let's move on. Look at what John says in verse 11. This is a powerful verse. An essential. The whole Bible is essential, but this verse articulates a fundamental truth for our faith. He says this, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. What life? Eternal life. Where is it found? In his son. That's it. I don't know how John or God through John could have made it any any more clear for us. Eternal life is found solely in Jesus Christ. You need to know that this truth distinguishes Christianity from all other religions. You take Islam, for example, what Islam Uh, says is that your life is kind of like standing on a fence and on one side of the fence um, is sin on the other side of the fence is obedience to Allah and at the end of your life Allah will basically weigh out how much time you spent on either side of the fence and the hope is that you spent the majority of your time on the good side of the fence and so it will it will be up to Allah at that time and he can push you one way or another but you're not promised anything so the best thing that you can do is to follow the five pillars of Islam so that you will stay on the good side of the fence it's all about doing Jehovah's witnesses would say that if um if you want to experience eternal life you need to accept the teachings of the Jehovah's Witness Bible. You need to be baptized as a Jehovah's Witness. You have to do, and you have to do certain works like go door to door and tell people about Jehovah. Mormons would say that you need to have faith. You need to obey the commandments of God. You must be baptized in the Mormon church. You need to receive the Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit by someone else laying their hands on you. You get married in a Mormon temple. You have to stay away from drinking certain drinks, and you need to tithe and obey everything that the the church teaches or says. Scientology, Tom Cruise and the Scientologists, um, I don't even know where to start with them, but they basically believe that your goal is, is to progress up this bridge to total freedom, which, requ- which requires you going through these certain motions to do so. Judaism would say you need to be committed to the one true God. You need to pray to him. You need to repent when you do something bad, but then you need to g- live a good moral life. And there's 613 laws to help you navigate through life. Christianity is different from all other religions because what Christianity does is it takes the spotlight off of you and what you try and do to obtain eternal life and it moves the spotlight onto Jesus Christ and everything that he has already done so that you and I can inherit eternal life. But Christianity can be extremely frustrating for for people who live in Austin, Texas because this room and this city is full of achievers. People who will work, will work 60 to 80 hours a week to be considered successful and to be validated by society. The problem is, is that there is absolutely nothing that you can do in your own power to achieve enough so that one day God will look at you and deem you worthy of eternal life. It's not possible. And for some of you, this truth hasn't, hasn't sunk in yet because part of you thinks, you know what? As long as I make it to church, as long as I do good things, as long as I donate to charities, as long as I get involved in the community, as as long as I don't experience moral failure, then surely God is going to look upon me with favor for all that I have done. But that thought process, it's there's no other word for it besides it, it's just silly. Because what that would be like, it would be like God walking you around heaven when you get there and introducing you to people. And he walks up to some people and he says, hey, I want to introduce you to so-and-so. He just got here. And you know what? This is a great story. You guys need to hear this. Angels gather around. Hey, you know what? My one and only son, Jesus Christ, who was and is God, 
stepped out of heaven and went to earth and he got up on a cross and he died for this man's sins, but it didn't cut it. It didn't take care of everything. And just when I thought that all hope was lost was that with this man, you know what? He donated to some charities and he did some good things and bam, we were right back in business. He's standing here today because of those final things that he did to seal the deal. Don't we hear that and just think that? That's ridiculous. Stop trying to earn salvation, earn eternal life by doing. You do because you already have eternal life, not so that you can get it. John is very clear. Life is found, eternal life is found in his son, Jesus Christ. John finishes the passage in verse 12. This is another powerful verse. And the thing that I love about this verse, and I want everyone to look at this verse Because I don't think that there, uh, I can't think of a better way for God to communicate the message of the gospel through John than what verse 12 says. Listen to it. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. How simple is that? How plain and clear? You know, you want to know what the message of Christianity is? This is it. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So what do we do with this? What do, what do we do with this passage from 1 John? I, I would suggest um, a few things. I think there's a few applications. Number one is this. Like, I know it's Christmas time, and we Christians, we do a a good job with coming up with cute little cliches sometimes. If you're non-religious, I apologize for our cliches, but we say things like, Jesus is the reason for the season. We, We love things that rhyme, don't we? Jesus is the reason for the season, and you know what, that, it sounds good, but let's be honest, you know what, Jesus is the reason we should celebrate every single day of, of our lives. Because he's the reason that one day we're going to stand face to face with a perfect and holy God. And we're not going to die solely because of Jesus. The only reason that we will be able to stand face to face with a perfect God. And we will get to spend eternity living with a perfect God. And we will be be at complete peace with him is because of Jesus. So it just kind of, doesn't it seem a little messed up when when. We don't really intentionally make Christ the center of everything until December. Now, you might, you might focus on Jesus during the, during the year, but I'm saying like December is when we are intentional about making Christ center. That's when we gather our family around and we read through the Gospels or we read through the story of Christmas or we say, you know what, we want to we focus on Jesus this Christmas. To me, that sounds a little messed up because In my opinion, Christmas should just be the continuation of what you've been doing all year, which is worshiping and adoring Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And because you have such a strong love for him, you're compelled to go out and to love others also. So maybe this year we don't try and make Christmas different. Maybe this Christmas we get prepared to make the whole next year different. Here's the second thing I think it means this passage, we better, be, we better be prepared to present the right message of the gospel. This Christmas, if you're, if you're with some family members and one of them was to come to you and say, hey, how do I become a Christian? Would you be able to tell them the, the true message of the gospel? Or would you mislead them by tacking on extra duties like um, doing good things and going to church and living a life that is honoring to Christ? All of those things are great things, but again, we do those things because we already have eternal life. It has nothing to do with receiving eternal life. The message of the gospel is this and only this. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Please do not muddy the waters out there by presenting a message that is not true. 
Uh, here's the last application, and I'll, I'll close with this. This past week, I went and saw a movie that's out right now called 127 Hours. And this movie, is it's not a family movie. I, I don't recommend that you gather your kids in the car and y'all go see this. It's really not a movie for the faint of heart. It is the story. It's a true story of a man named Aaron Ralston. If you will remember, Aaron Ralston was a man that in two, 2003 was hiking in Utah. And he dislodged this big rock, and the rock fell and crushed his, his arm, and it trapped him. And so 127 Hours is basically the movie about the five days that Aaron Ralston um, was trapped with his arm underneath this rock. And the whole movie kind of chronicles all the different things that Aaron does to try and break free from this rock. And in the end, I mean, you, you remember hearing the news story, but what the reason it was so famous is that Aaron Ralston cut his arm off with a pocket knife and saved his life. And as I was thinking about it this week, in a very similar way, um, every single one of us is trapped under the weight and rock of sin. But unlike Aaron Ralston, who was able to do certain things to save his physical life, there's absolutely nothing that you and I can do to save our spiritual life. There's absolutely nothing that you and I can do in our own power to save ourselves from our sin. But the beauty of Christianity is that Christ comes along and he offers to remove the rock and lift the rock for us by dying on the cross. But the question is, is do you want him to move your rock and your sin for you or not because if you choose to hold on to that rock or to stay trapped under there john is very clear he who has the son has life but he who does not have the son of god does not have life you will experience death not not physical death but spiritual death which is eternal separation from a perfect god so let me just ask you plain and simple do you have the son do you have the Son and in turn have, have life? I want to end a little differently this morning. I want to end by just giving people in here who have never invited the Son to come into their lives, I want to end by giving you an opportunity to do that. To have the Son is simply to invite Jesus Christ to come into your life, to be your Savior for, from your sins, and to begin to lead you through this life. So will you pray with me? And if that's you in here, if you've finally just come to a true understanding of who Jesus is as the Son of God and you realize that you've been trying to earn your way um, into heaven and you've realized that you can't, it's about having the Son, having the Son brings life, I I'm going to share a prayer with you. It's not a rabbit's foot prayer. There's nothing magical about it, but I just want to help you express to God what is true in your heart. So I encourage you to pray, pray with me. Right now, pray this. Jesus, I believe that you truly are the Son of God. And I believe that I am a sinner. And I want to invite you, Jesus, to come into my life and save me from my sins. And I pray that you would begin to take over my life. Pray this. Jesus, thank you for the promise of eternal life for those who believe. If you just invited Jesus Christ into your life for the first time, we want you to know there's going to be some pastors back at Starting Point, which is just right outside the auditorium. Come talk to us. We'd love to talk to you about the decision that you just made. But I'll close us in prayer and just say, God, thank you so much for who you are, that you have given us your son, and you, you have given testimony that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God, the God man. And we praise you, Jesus, for all that you have done for us. We love you. Thank you that in you and in you alone is life. In Jesus' name, amen.